Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, um, is where we spent most of our time last week. Okay, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, Okay. We know some things about this present evil world and this body of sin that we wear. And we went back to Romans 8. And why do we suffer in this present evil world? That's what we spent time studying last week in Romans chapter 8. We suffer why? Because the kingdom didn't come. And we read about the healing of the earth in the kingdom sickness anybody eating anybody else nope kids play with the most dangerous critters on the earth the very ones that God used to wreak judgment on Israel remember those two she bears killed 47 kids killed the children I mean if you want to push a political agenda what do you use today the children. It's for the children. <laughs> but here's the thing. We understand that the kingdom didn't come, so we suffer. And we suffer, so God equipped us with what? A treasure house, we studied in chapter 4, to endure the suffering. Did he not? And we speak, yet we suffer because we believed. Do you remember all that we studied? And right now the entire creation is in the bondage of corruption. It didn't do it. Who did it? Why does God use the critters and not say Israelites <laughs> to offer on the altar? <laughs> because Israelites aren't innocent. But the critters were. If the critters have no conscience, are they innocents? They're innocents. And the reason they eat each other? Survival of the fittest. Yeah, well, you could say it that way. But really, God calls it the bondage of corruption. <laughs> You're witnessing the bondage of corruption. Does mankind dominate and eat each other? Kill each other? And why do the critters suffer? Because of us. And because the glorious liberty of the sons of God has not been ushered in in the kingdom. And we're still left on the earth, so we suffer, so we groan. Hence, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, not only groans not enough, it says what? We travail in what? We groan and travail in pain. That's this present suffering. And the only reason we do it's because the kingdom didn't come. So he equipped us with all sufficiency, spiritually, to endure faithfully. And faithfully means and keep speaking. Now we're in a chapter that it's not David believed and therefore spoke. So we, because of what? This resurrection life in us, soul and spirit, we believe and we speak. Why do we speak? Because we want others to enter into His glory. Right? Not only that, our message and a component of that message, our hope, reconciles our walk for ministry, causes us to walk for Him. And that's what we're going to talk about. How is it that our message and the hope in it causes us to serve Him and henceforth not live unto ourselves? Okay, so we spent time just in the first verse last week. So I want to move on um, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As believers, we know what God has prepared for us, even prior. Now, here's the wonderful thing prior to first fruits, um, that is, prior to the assemblage of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, with its service and conduct evaluated, right? Um, the harvest reckoned, and everyone what? In an appropriate position, in that agency of God, that agency of righteousness and eternal life in the heavenly places. 
Okay? We know something else. Prior to first fruits, do we have information concerning that? In other words, when a loved one dies, when a friend dies, when a friend of a friend dies, and we go to the funeral, and there's sorrow there, right? Because they have no hope. And do we, as believers, not sorrow because we know something? We not only know first fruits is coming, we know something else. We know what happens when a saint dies before first fruits comes. Before it comes. Okay? Verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house made, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We know that we have what? A celestial, eternal body fashioned like unto his glorious body. And that word there is dissolve. You ever think about that word dissolve? How do you dissolve something in this earth? The universal solvent, which is water. Water dissolves everything. Uh, yeah, you throw a body in the ground, bugs, flies, microscopic bacterium, but the universal solvent does the job, okay? And dissolved means the molecules literally do what? Dissolve into what? The earth. Dust you were and dust you'll return, okay? From organic to inorganic, okay? That's what happens. Um, verse 2, for this we groan. What's our groan? Okay, what's your gripe? What do you groan? We groan this. We want to be clothed upon. We desire it in our hearts. We want to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Um, there's times in our lives where we desire it more than others, like when we're sick. <laughs> or we reach an age of unhealthiness, right? As this body perishes, begins to perish. You know, and the blood, everybody talks about the, the blood doesn't get around the body. It's all about that. It's about the blood to the systems because the life's in the blood. That's why God says to Cain, what, what, did, he, what did he know happened? The, he heard something. The blood of righteous Abel did what? Cried from the ground. He could hear the blood. The life's in the blood. Um, we earnestly desire to be clothed with an eternal body. Okay? Notice the words he uses here. I, I want to show you from verse 1. When he refers to the body, I want you to notice how the Lord refers to it, the flesh. Uh, the first time he refers to it, he says, earthly house. Earthy, dust. Tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle isn't life, Right? If there's any life in the tabernacle, it's people that have gone into the tabernacle. Um, it says a building. Uh, the building isn't life. The building isn't the church. The church is the people that gather together in one place. Uh, notice it says clothing in verse 2. What do you think God's kind of trying to get across with these words? You are not your body. You are not your body. Not only that, you are cut free from its dominion and the lust thereof. He wants us to think like that. That's why he uses this terminology. Yet, we act sometimes like this body is all there is. The world, they literally, when it comes down to a physiological, scientific explanation, say there's no evidence for the soul and the spirit. Well, if that isn't a bunch of hooey, there sure is. There sure is. And do they refer to it as terms of accommodation constantly? Does the, un, does the secular world refer to the soul and the body? The spirit and the soul? Absolutely. But scientifically, they won't recognize it. We're just a body. What a pitiful bunch of naysayers, sci the scientific community, aren't they? What message do you have that I could possibly want? Let's say everything you're saying, professing, is true. What does it offer me? You're nothing but a speck of nothing in the physical configuration of the universe. 
Earth is nothing special. You are nothing special. And when you die, you become nothing. Oh, I want to become a scientist. <laughs> what do they offer us? They seem to have pleasure in it, like they're, sa they're sadists. They are sadists. They enjoy being professors, telling everybody else that you are doomed and you're nothing. That's the opposite message we get from who? God our Savior. Opposite message. We don't want to be noticed. Verse 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found. What? The body and the soul need a what? A tabernacle. A building. Clothing. To operate. Not only here, but out there. It's obvious. Because it calls us naked. Without the body, we're naked. That's real nakedness. By the way, that helps you understand Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, they fell. And what'd they do? They put on what? Didn't they already have clothing on? A body? Yeah, they did. Why'd they cover Why did they want to cover it? Because now, with a body, they felt naked. Why? Because of sin. They were ashamed. That's why people are ashamed today to be naked. And it produces illicit desires. Desires for it and not this eternal body. Right? Does the world desire the body, the flesh? Yeah, when it's young and beautiful and pretty. Beautiful people. I don't want you on our television show. You might be talented. You might have what we're looking for, but you're ugly and nobody wants to look at you. Clothed, but not naked. Okay? Um, look at verse 4. Again, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Notice, notice the word here. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. In this present suffering, we groan to be clothed, first fruits, so that mortality that is subject to death, the body that we have, gets swallowed whole by life. Spirit, soul, and then first fruits, body. Okay? Groanings in man, in his own strength. That results in imaginations, right? Oh, I love watching science fiction. Why? We're going to inherit the heavens in science fiction, right? Right? Space travel, right? No need, no want, just the acquisition of knowledge. <laughs> you know, science fiction. Attributes that are the Lord's. Attributes that are maybe angelic, demonic. That's science fiction. Uh, Night of the Living Dead. Do you want to be clothed in that mess that's dissolving? No. No, I don't. It's horrible. Yeah, it is. Well, let's watch it. Let's watch it again and again. Notice verse 5. We desire to be clothed with that tabernacle, that building, that house, that clothing that's eternal. Now look what verse 5 says. This is fascinating. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing as God. What we desire, what did he do? He desired. We desire this thing in this present suffering. The kingdom didn't come. And what we desire he wrought what our desire is. Did he not? Our desire is to be clothed with an eternal house. But not in sin. Do we want the sinful body eternal? That's why Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden so they couldn't eat of the tree of life and live in that state forever because there was the first host that did live like that. Do the angels die? 
Do they live in sin, those fallen angels? Aren't you glad we don't live in sin and can't die, but are rather mortal and have this desire to be clothed from above with a body not subject to death and not subject to sin? That thing is done. And that body is to be dissolved. Okay? Um, what we groan for, the Lord has wrought. It's begun with a down payment, which is called the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. It's begun. We've already been glorified. We already have the down payment for it. It's a done deal. We're glorified. It's just a matter of what? Time. His creation. Revelations 20, 22, 1 says, And he showed me a, a pure river of living water, we referred to it this morning, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in a kingdom of God in the earth. Look at verse 6. Therefore we are always confident, knowing. Okay, How did, where does confidence come from in this verse? It's just a generic thing here. Where does confidence come from? Next word. Knowing. Confidence comes from knowing. We know why we suffer. Does the world know why they suffer? We do. Are we confident about their hope? Does the, does the world have hope? False hope. False hope. Imagined hope. Science fiction hope. Always confident. Notice the word always. Why? Because once you get that knowledge of the truth of the Word of God, you're, you can be always confident. Always confident. You might have your moments, but what you retreat to? The Word of God. And what does that produce? Confidence. Security. I mean, that's a good thing in that verse right there. You want to define confidence, where it comes from? It comes from knowing the truth. Knowing that, and here's the specific truth. Whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. On, on, on the basis of relying exclusively on the object of those words, the Word of God. Right? Uh, notice, go up to verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? We focus on the eternal. And you can't focus on the eternal by sight. You can't. And here's all these believers and everything's sight to them. Everything's sight to them. What does that produce? No confidence and no security. Because those are temporal things. Our focus is the eternal thing. Our deep desire and groaning is this eternal body, this celestial body. Not subject to the law of sin and death. For we walk by faith, not sight. That takes us right back to verse 18, the conclusion of chapter 4, does it not? Isn't that the antecedent of that parenthetical statement that everybody quotes all the time? They go together. Okay, It's like the treasure house. Can you see the treasure house that we have within? And the treasure house is a supply for the trouble of this present suffering. Um, verse 8. We are confident. You see this word confident popping up? <laughs> Knowing, we know, confidence pops up, pops up, pops up. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. What's the desire and what initially was the desire? To be absent from here and present with him. Uh, at this conference we just had down in uh, South Bend, um, we saw Mary, Mary showed me a thing on, on the Internet of a little boy who had cancer. And when we watched that, he'd already died. And they said, uh, what was the question? What's your favorite thing about being a Christian, a believer? And he said, uh, no cancer, number one. No sickness, right? And what was number two? I'll be present with the, my Savior, with Jesus, he said. What's that verse say right there? What are we willing rather to be? 
Out of the mouth of babes. I don't care if they taught it to him. He said it. He meant it. Out of the mouth of babes, right? He wanted to be present with Jesus. That little boy. Four-year-old or something like that, right? Articulate. Um, and that's where he is right now. His desire is what we're reading about right here. Before first fruits. Okay, we're still absent from the body, but there's no more sin. And we might be naked, but we're not ashamed. Do you see why? You are not in the presence of sin anymore. And you don't wear the body of sin anymore, that corrupt thing. Okay. Wherefore, now, the whole point of verses 1 through 8 are coming up here. Um, I, I, I'll say before we go into that, only faith can produce assurance. Empiricism can't do it. The world offers that, you know, the scientific community, the five senses, employing them to observe and test. Or rationalism, that is, employs us trying to figure it out, and we can't. Okay. Faith has this illustrative object for us in the scriptures, in the words of life, in the one we follow, who is the Apostle Paul. Take a look. Look at Acts 14. Acts 14. X14. X14. And we'll end with this illustration today. X14. Uh, X14, and take a look at verse 19. Paul's on his first apostolic journey from his home church at Antioch, and he's in Asia Minor. Modern day Turkey, where everything's going on <laughs> right now today. Um, take a look at verse 19. And there came certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Well, that's where he was. And the Jews are doing what? Well, it's kind of like when you're looking for Frankenstein or the ogre and you get the torches. You know, you get the torches and the guns and the staves and the knives, and you're going through the woods with your torches, and you're looking for Paul. That's what they're doing. That's how much those guys were fired up about Paul's message. They're hunting him down. They're hunting him. And it says, notice it says Jews. Who's the ones fired up? The unbelieving, apostate Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. So who do they come to? Well, Paul's in Lystra now. They come to the people at Lystra and they convince them. They persuade them. The people. And having stoned... I mean, it doesn't say a whole lot there, does it? They persuaded the people to stone him. They stirred up that mob and they were going to stone him. doesn't sound like they're doing it according to the law, does it? Those Jews. No. If you don't believe the one that came to fulfill the law, the one that Moses wrote about, I guess you don't care about what Moses wrote, <laughs> what God wrote. And so they stir the people into a mob and they stone Paul. Can you imagine the pain of that? Bam, 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 bam. And everybody's trying to get a headshot, right, to take you down. And they stone him. You know how people, you're down, they still throw stones? Well, I got five more stones, I still want to throw them, Right? I mean, you know, you can picture it, right? And it says, drew him out of the city. So what did they do, the disciples that were with him? They dragged his body out. Carried it, dragged it, I don't know. They drew it out. Supposing he had been what? As far as they know, he was dead. That doesn't mean he wasn't dead. It simply means that God didn't intend for him to stay dead. And it goes on to say, how be it as the disciples stood round about him. So here we, here's the scene. They get him out of the city. Why? Well, that's where all the mob, you have to get away from the mob. They're going to go after us too. So they drag Paul out and they're out where there's no people. And what are they doing? They're all around him like this. And they say, they're all going like this. What do we do now? <laughs> right? The leader's gone. Well, what do we do now? And the answer came. It says, verse 20, Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up. Can you imagine the expression on their faces? <laughs> and their voices. 
and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. So, what happened? Paul gets up. Now, would you think he'd go back to Lystra? Mm, probably not. Paul did. And what happened? Well, they're not in a mob anymore. Everybody quieted down and their, their, their bloodlust has like waned, right? And who do they, some of them see walking around? Paul. And what do they say? Hey, you know that guy we stoned? I saw him walking around. No, you didn't, right? And then he takes off and does what? With Barnabas, his messianic witness of the things of God for the Gentiles, right? That's what Barnabas was. He's a messianic saint. His hope is a kingdom on the earth. And he's there to witness the truth of God in Paul. And it says here, they went to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, so they, they got saved and they taught them. And it just makes me feel like a nothing. I read this stuff. It says, they returned again to what? Went back to Lystra. You can't kill this message. Have they been able to kill it in 2,000 years? Are there those? Do you understand that Karl Marx, what gave him the impetus to create the theology that he created, the dynamic that he created, right, which is a form of relativism, he was inspired by Christians because he hated Christianity. That's what inspired that guy. He hated Christianity. How's that worked out for him? Well, personally, not good. Unless he got saved at the end. It says, and to Iconium and Antioch. And then it says confirming. So they got set. You preach the gospel. You teach the doctrine. And then what do you do? You confirm it. People need that confirmation in the Word of God, don't they? You heard it the first time, you understood it, and now what do you need? You need to be sure. You need to know for sure so that you can be confident. Okay. So Paul has this experience. What do you think of an experience like that? Do you think it changed you a little bit? Well, guess what the Word of God does for us? It confirms this experience because Paul conveys it to the people that need it. And that's all of us, but in time, to the Corinthians. Take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. By the way, the disciples that stood round about Paul's body, they were one of the things in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and that's perplexed, confused. They didn't know what to do. They were leaderless. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, guess what Paul does? He conveys this experience. Why did I bring this up? Because we're talking about why we labor in verses 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 7, right? 1 through 7. And it's talking about what happens prior to first fruits. Did this event happen to Paul prior to first fruits? Yeah. Did he die? Yeah. You go, well, it says supposed to be dead. That's what they thought. But look what he says to the Corinthians at the end of the second epistle. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. It is not profitable. It's not profitable for me, the needful thing, to glory in the thing I'm going to convey to you. In the thing I'm going to convey to you. I mean, are there literature and theater Right? Movies about people going to heaven and coming back. All the way through our history. You know, when I was younger, well, what's that movie where, I can't remember the name of the title of the movie, but the guy dies, he's a football player, Warren Beatty, and he dies, and he goes to heaven, and they made a mistake, they grabbed the wrong guy. Heaven... Heaven can wait. And he goes up to heaven and they send him back down in another body. Do you remember that? And the body's all out of shape and he has to get it in shape because he's a quarterback. Do you remember that movie? And he falls in love in the other body, right? Then he comes back in his original body and she doesn't know him anymore by recognition. 
I, I'm just saying, it's littered with this idea, see. Paul went to heaven and came back. Where did they get that from? It's, it's the brilliance of the adversary in, in the imaginations of the wisdom of men. Because look what Paul says. It is expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Not. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man, talks in the third person. Why? Well, if somebody went to heaven and back, just like they did in Lystra, which is do what? They called Paul and Barnabas what? Jupiterus, Mercurius. They worshipped them, worshiped them as celestial bodies. And what did Paul do? They rent their garments and said, we are of men of like passion as you are. Paul's not going to glory in this thing. Because what would happen if you went to heaven and came back? You become the object of faith and worship and a, and, 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 uh, 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 looking for the grammatical form, I'm an idiot. Adulation, I was talking about apostates, right? Idolatry, for heaven's sakes. You become the object of idolatry when you're trying to preach the gospel of grace. And so he says to the Corinthians, some folks that are rather weak, he says, he talks in the third person, but he turns it around to the first person as he keeps going. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. You count it back in Acts, that's Lystra, first apostolic journey. Whether in the body I cannot tell. What is he telling us about? Second Corinthians chapter 5, being naked. I couldn't tell if I was in or out of the body. Now, how is that possible? He could see fingers. How about the guy down in hell? That soul, stripped of the body and the spirit. And he says, I want something on my tongue. And I can see Abraham's bosom, paradise, afar off. And there's a gulf betwixt. Remember that? So, it has sh so in other words, the soul has shape and form. Because Paul couldn't tell. He goes on to say, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, that's the presence of God, that's beyond the firmament and the sea of frozen glass and the twelve gates. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Can, man can't do it. Man can't do it. Express it. He goes on to say, Of such a one, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory. I mean, I'll glory in what I witnessed, but I won't say I earned it or deserved it or was worthy of it. I'll just say I experienced the glory of it. That is Second Corinthians chapter five. A loved one dies and absent from the body, what? That's what Paul was. We got an illustration of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 prior to first fruits. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine what? I'm going to glory in my suffering, Corinthians, the very thing that you accuse me of not being the apostle of Christ. I'm going to my sufferings are my badge and I'm going to glory in them and not this experience. I didn't produce this experience. The Lord hath wrought this thing. And we have a hope prior to first fruits. Like that little kid said, present with him. Absent from the body, present with the Lord verse 6, for though I would desire to glory, I will not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which is he seeth to me to be, or that he heareth of me. In other words, Paul didn't want what? You know how we are. We want a Michael Jordan. We want a Tiger Woods. We want a, Mike, a LeBron James. We want celebrities. And Paul says, I am not the celebrity. God forbid, he's the celebrity. It was wrought of him. 
That's what Paul's doing in the third person here. He switches around to the first person. I'm not going to cover that. Instead, I, I want to just finish off on Philippians. What Paul writes of his experience in his first physical death to the Corinthians, he later conveys to the Philippians concerning his attitude in the flesh as a result of this experience. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And we'll stop here. Philippians 1. Verse 21. Ah, 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope. Earnest expectation. That's another word for that phrase. Confidence. And my hope that in nothing shall I be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is... To stay here, that's his resurrection life. That's what I yearn for. That's what I daily exercise my faith for. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I will would not. I, I, got, I got this groaning and this desire to beware present with him. I didn't, I didn't exactly want to be sent back. But look what he says. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, just like that little kid said, right? Which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more what? Needful to you. And that's kind of how we should think, and that's how I think. I go, it's needful that I don't kill myself off to be with him. Why? Well, he spent all these years to be able to do what? Build people up in the truth and confirm the souls. This desire right here is the fruit of that experience. And it's needful for us so that we can have confidence and assurance before first fruits. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We're thankful for the life of our Savior in us. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, page 302, number 3.